Somebody needs an outline. Would you hold on to that for me? That's the last one I have. Thank you.
We're going to sing a couple of songs. <laughs> this one's a little mashup. It's two songs we sort of pushed into one. Both songs have the same melody, the same, all the same parts, but uh, may have a related message. So we're going to sing those. <clears throat> I'm not ashamed to owe my Lord. Can anybody see that? So I'm not ashamed to own oh my Lord, nor to defend his cause, maintain the honors of his word, the <coughs> glory of his cross. Oh, for a faith that will not shrink, though pressed by every foe, that will not tremble on the brink of any earthly foe, that will not murmur or complain beneath the chastening rod, but in the hour of grief or pain will lean upon its God. A faith that shines more bright and clear when tempests rage without, that when in danger knows no fear, in darkness feels no doubt. Lord, give us such a faith as this, and let whatever may come, will
Strong said that uh, Shauna came through her test yesterday good. Um, she's in Tampa, and they're going to have the, the results of the biopsy in two weeks. So keep Shauna strong in your prayers. Yes, wonderful news. I'm Larry and Dominic Tanaka. Larry and Dominic. There's no one else to go to God for prayer. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for sparing our lives and giving us the opportunity to come out and to study your word. We, we're so grateful for such a wonderful day that you've granted us. We thank you, Father, that we live in this part of the country, that we have sunshine almost every day, and, and we Amen. thank you for that, dear God. We thank you, Father, for the love that we have one for another. We thank you for the fellowship that we have one for another. We thank you, dear God, for every good and every perfect gift that comes down from you. Father, as we come together tonight, we, we realize that there are many on our prayer list. There are some that have been on our prayer list for quite some time, and 
and we just pray your blessings upon them. We pray for all of those who were mentioned tonight, dear God. Bless them according to their needs and bless them according to, to your will. Father, we pray especially for those who are in hospitals and those who are shut in and those who are in nursing homes and, and those who just could not be with us tonight. We thank you, Father, and we know that you uh, have the power to, to answer prayers and to look out for them. We thank you, Father, for those who will be undergoing surgeries and, and examinations, and we just pray that you would be with them, dear God. We pray for the doctors and the nurses and those who would be looking after them and providing care for them. We know, dear God, that you are the, are the great physician and you can heal all things. We thank you, Father, for all the resources that you give us. We thank you, Father, for technology and for skill and for innovation and for Amen. all the things that you give us to, to help us along the way. But we also look, at, look to thee, Father, who is the source. And we know that you can heal all of our wounds and all of our illnesses. We just ask you to be with us, dear God, and be with those especially who are in need at this time. We thank you, Father, for a chance to study your word tonight and uh, be with Brother Russ and all of the teachers who will be standing and teaching your word tonight. May we understand your word as it applies to our lives. Be with us in all that we do to support your cause. And we forever thankful for your son, Jesus, who died for our sin. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Willie. Well, we're still on our series on the Beatitudes, and uh, I know I've been asking you if you need uh, any of the bookmarkers that Diane Odie has made for our class, and I've got a few here. If you haven't gotten one, you can raise your hand. After tonight, uh, she's putting them on eBay for $7.99 a piece. So tonight it's free. So is there anybody here that needs a bookmark? Anybody at all? Okay, over here. Um, Lisa, would you hand these out for me? Thank you. Sure. There we go. She gets a part of the profits, so. And there's a couple more here, Lisa, three more here. Oh, you know, thank you, Joe, for leading that song. I love that song, don't you? Farther along. I love it. Raise your hand real high if you need more. Don't you dare let me see them on eBay from you. <laughs> Don't you dare sell them. <laughs> Diane put a lot of work into these. I love that verse we sang. Tempted and tried, we're off made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long. Now listen to this. While there are others living about us, never molested, though in the wrong. Doesn't that bother you sometimes? You know, we're trying to live our Christian life, and we're tormented, and we have trials and tests, and, and people that are stinkers, I mean real rascals, they, they got it made. Everything falls, they, they just, everything in their life is so easy. Uh, I'll never forget, you know, I worked in a steel factory for 11 years, and there were people that worked there 40 years and never got laid off one time. They don't even know what it's like to make it on unemployment or food stamps or anything like that. And they, their life, and, and they were stinkers. I mean, they were people that lived life for the devil, you know. But here they were, man. They had it made. Everything's fallen in place. They're doing great. And I often wonder, why. And David said that in Psalm 100, 124. I mean, he was talking, Lord, why are they, why is my enemy being blessed? And here I am trying to live for you, and, and I'm tormented by Absalom and all these people that are making problems in my kingdom. And, and I, just, I just think there are times where we, where we get that feeling, you know, that way. Well, I was reading this story that I think really talks about persecution because that's where we're at tonight. And this is what it says. My wife gave me a gift for Christmas I can really use. She gave me a health club membership, and I became very excited. I was so enthused, I decided to begin a diary. Day one, dear diary, 
I got up this morning, had a light breakfast, and out the door at the club, I met my trainer, Olga. Her teeth were perfect and white. She had blonde hair and looked like a model. She had a wonderful smile, and I think that I'm in love. (laughs) Olga started me out on the treadmill, slowly at first, and I know I impressed her with my endurance, all the while sucking in my belly to appear firm and lean. I sensed a smile and attraction as I increased the weight on the barbells. (laughs) Overall, I was tired and wore out, but ready for tomorrow. Day two. Dear diary, I got up late, sucked down some coffee, and feeling too tired to go to work out. Olga remarked about my tardiness and and seemed very testy. I made it through the workout and literally fell into the car. Day three, dear diary, (laughs) I couldn't get out of bed this morning. My legs and my arms won't work. The only way I could brush my teeth was to put the toothbrush on the sink and move my mouth back and forth. (laughs) No time to eat. My wife put a Pop-Tart in my mouth, but I couldn't chew. I drove the car with my knees and collided with three parked cars in the parking lot. Olga greeted my lateness with a sneer. Her smile reminded me of a pit bull, and the order she gave made Olga sound like a Nazi. She was angry by my shortened workout. I tried to do the best I could, but spent the rest of the day in bed. <laughs> day, day, day four, dear diary, I hate Olga. <laughs> All she did today was complain about my attempt at a workout. Every part of my body hurts. Suicide was a consideration. Uh, Olga kept me telling that my screaming while I was lifting weights was bothering the other clients. <laughs> day five, dear diary, I stayed in bed all day, not going to the health club anymore. Next year, I hope my wife gives me something better, like a root canal. (laughs) That's talk about persecution, you know. If you've ever worked out too much in one day, the next day you're done. Uh, Well, persecution. What is persecution? Uh, There's all kinds of persecution. Um, And and there are a lot of people in the world that have suffered persecution. Um, I'm reminded of, of people that go through all kinds of persecution, and we don't even know about them. Um, I was talking to Alex uh, last week, was it, when Alex was here, talking about uh, brother, when Brother Baird was taking uh, Bibles for China, and then Alex took over that ministry, of talking about all the underground churches in China. They can't meet publicly, so they have to meet in coffee shops and pizza places and, you know, in homes undercover, underground churches. There's a lot of churches, he said, that we don't even know about in China, more than we can count. But they're not meeting in church buildings, most of them. And they're persecuted. They're told they can't worship. They shouldn't worship. They shouldn't evangelize. Don't have Bible studies with people. In fact, where did you get that Bible? And some of the Bibles are printed underground without the government knowing. Um, I'm reminded of the fact that there's a lot of things going on over there that that we don't know about that we probably should know about. Um, When I was at the Fried Hardeman lectures, uh, there was a man who got up in the pulpit and talked about our missionaries in in Kathmandu, Nepal. Have you ever heard of Kathmandu, Nepal? Um, there were several ministers that were imprisoned there, and uh, I think four, and they had a big uh, banner on the stage, and we all went up and signed it to encourage them. They were going to sneak it over there to the church in Nepal. Um, they're still meeting underground, and uh, I didn't know this, but if you have a Bible study with somebody and the government finds out, you get seven years in prison. If you baptize somebody... That's 14 years, and these men were in for 14 years. I don't know if they ever came out or what happened, but I'm told and have read that those prisons in Nepal are not very nice, and so we have to pray for people that are being uh, persecuted as far as missionaries are concerned. My cousin Don Bone was in the Philippines as a missionary 
back in the 50s and 60s, and uh, he talked about the fact that life over there, lifespan is tenuous at best. There are times when you don't know if you're going to make it. You don't know what's going to happen. Now, that was back in the 50s and 60s. I'm not sure what it's like now. Um, but I had one man who was a minister who was always also a professor in the, one of the universities there, and he was looking for support. And I was talking to him. I was communicating with him back in the 90s, 80s. I think it was in the 80s. And uh, I found out later that he had been, uh, they found out that he was communicating with Americans and was supported by Americans, and uh, they came into his office and they shot him with a shotgun and killed him. So there's a lot of persecution going on in the world that we don't know about, some of it physical. And so we have to be looking at Scripture differently after you see what's going on in the world. I think it changes a little bit uh, just to know some of those things that are going on. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 5 and let's talk about persecution because Jesus wants us to know, you know, that, that we're going to be persecuted. It may not be with a shotgun. It may not be within prison. It may not be, uh, you know, trying to, to start the church in a country like that, but it can be persecution even in our country today. So let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 5. And I want to start reading uh, in verse 9, I'm sorry, 10, verse 10, and I want to read all the way down through verse 12. So let's read 10 through 12. Who has our Bible open and who has the microphone? Does God have the microphone? Who has it? Yeah, oh, Zach. Thank you, Zach. Uh, Charlie, you got that? No? I can look. Verse 12? Uh, verse 10 through 12. And that microphone in your lap works better up here, okay? There you go. <laughs> Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Hey, chap, uh, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you, falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so every for they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Okay. He's talking here in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, he's, he's gone through these, uh, these areas on, in the Beatitudes, and as I said last week, some commentaries look at this like a stepladder, like you start out with humility, then you talk about being sorry for your sins and being able to say, I was wrong. And then it's each one of those steps gets a little harder, and this is the last one. And you can imagine how hard that is. Be happy when you're persecuted? Does that make sense to you? It doesn't to me. Be happy that you're persecuted. Yeah, Scott? It just goes to show again how important the, the preceding Beatitudes are because how can you handle being persecuted without humility and without without meekness. Exactly, exactly. And each one of those builds, doesn't it, to get you to that point where you can handle persecution. A lot of Christians, as remember, who, who do we say Jesus was talking to here? Who was it in the first and second verse? Who were they? I underlined that in my Bible. It starts with a D. Disciples, that's right. He's talking to us. When we get to that point where we have these attitudes in line, then we can take the persecution. Then we can take the anxiety. But not everybody can handle this. This is not easy sermon. It's not easy. Um, I grew up in a church where my preacher seemed to step on my toes every single week. Did you have a preacher like that when you grew up? <laughs> he, oh man, he could fire. On, and it, I mean, it was fire and brimstone sermons. And, but I'll tell you, it's amazing that, that we're able to take those kind of things that the world's dishing out sometimes. Some people can do it, some others can't. And this is the top rung. Why? Because this is the hardest one. Loving your enemy, being happy when you're persecuted, it's not easy. 
It's not easy. So let's look at this. Uh, you know, Lyle had a good idea last week. Uh, would you share that with him, Lyle? Grab that microphone. Zach, thank you. Uh, he talked about the fact that this could be two or three Beatitudes. Go ahead, Lyle. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Russ. One of the um, scholars on the Sermon Mount that I like says that there's nine, and then verse 12 is, or verse 11 is the ninth Beatitude. And he says they work as cup or triplets. And he said the first one is blessed are the peacemakers. Well, it, that needs to be tempered because sometimes peacemaking lends to being nosy and a busybody. He said, so we temper that by, are you still a peacemaker when you're willing to see your own blood? Blessed are the persecuted. Well, how do you do that? Because this one is blessed are those who are persecuted because there is a reward waiting for you. Yeah. That's what motivates you to be a peacemaker tempered by being a peacemaker at the sight of your own blood, but recognizing the fact that you're being held in high esteem by God because uh, that's what the prophets before you did. Very good. You know, I, I think there's a lot of ways of looking at these, these Beatitudes that we haven't looked at before. That's one of them that Lyle's talking about. Sometimes we get so locked into to looking at a Beatitude and we forget about all the different ideas that commentaries bring up and and scholars bring up. I, I like that, Lyle. I think it gives us a good different look than what I've ever heard before. And that's why when he brought it up to me last week, I said, I got to let him share that with the congregation. So thank you, Lyle. Uh, there's, there's so many things to be said about this. And I don't think that we can really encapsulate what persecution is. Um, have you ever known anybody that was persecuted? Now, there's something, there's a qualifier here. It says, if you've been persecuted for what? Righteousness. And we determine righteousness, those who hunger first after righteousness, righteousness is the right relationship with God. In fact, in my Bible, I wrote next to that beatitude, the right relationship with God. When was the last time you used the word righteousness in a conversation? Anybody? It doesn't come up very much, does it? Not very often. So people don't know what righteousness is. What is righteousness? It's the right relation. So if we're persecuted, not persecuted for anything, persecuted because of our right, our right relationship with God. That's the qualifier. There are a lot of per people that are persecuted in the world, but this is the qualifier. It has to be for the right relationship with God. That's what the Beatitudes are about. Remember, Jesus is trying to teach his disciples a different way of life. And he's trying to teach them. And, and that's what he said in Matthew chapter 3 when John was going to baptize him. He said, you want me to baptize you? You should baptize me. And Jesus says, I need to do this to fulfill my righteousness with my Father. Jesus wanted to be baptized to have the right relationship with God. And that's a good reason for us to be baptized, isn't it? If he was baptized, maybe we should be baptized to have the right relationship with God. It's not just to have our sins washed away, not just to get to heaven, not just to clothe ourselves with Christ, not just to be saved, not to have our sins washed away. It could be to have the right relationship with the Father like Jesus said. So that's why it's so important to look at these to see the things that we see when we're persecuted. There are some people, and you know, I deal with some Christians who are carrying the sins around on their shoulders, and they were baptized and all their sins were washed away, but they're still carrying them. They're still walking around with them. Something that happened 40 years ago it was washed away in the baptistry and they're, st they're still crying and, and getting treatment and counseling. And uh, Zach, I bet you know people like that in, in your counseling that they're carrying around things as a child that they should have put. How do, you, how do you work with people like that, Zach? How do you deal with that? I, I like to... I just did someone today, had a client today that um, she was, she's in her 60s and she keeps on bringing up herself when she was four years old, herself when she was 10 years old. 
and also worried about the future. So lots of anxiety, lots of trauma. And um, to start off, I like doing grounding techniques, which is all about focusing on the present. On the what? The present. Oh. What's in front of you right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. I need her in the room with me, not in the past, not in the future. Yeah. Right this second. I feel like that's a powerful thing we have with prayer is that we can have a presence with God right now. Not hoping God will be in the future, not focusing too much on what he did for us in the past, but seeing where he is right now. I think that's a powerful thing we have with prayer. Well, that's a good and starting place. Enhance. He knows all the stuff. He knows all the <laughs> lingo, let me tell you. Um, he's effective at it. Thank you. Danny had your hand up over here. Come on up here with the microphone, Zach, and give it to Danny here. He loves to take the microphone. <laughs> yeah, I, I never thought about it this way before, but I think Susan and I are persecuted by our granddaughter. She's a lesbian. She's married, and they have a kid, which is my great-grandchild. Yeah. And we're not allowed to see him or have oh. him over to the house or to take him to church. Oh, wow. That's tough. Yeah. you got to love her because she's a relative. Yeah. You know, I had a, I had a situation while I was, had a Bible study with people who uh, their grandchildren were not living the right lifestyle, but I, tell, I told them you got to keep up a relationship and love them. You know, keep keep that relationship open and love them, and and uh, you can repair relationships. What yeah, else did it, you it's have? It's been it, it's been sometimes it's been harder than others. We used to be able to have him over to our house with, mm -hmm. as long as our daughter was her mother was along with mm -hmm, us. Mm -hmm. it, things have gotten harder now. Wow, we don't see him at all. That's hard. You know. In our Bible study on Monday night over here in this room, we were talking about the fact that not everybody's ready to accept the Lord Jesus in the form that we find in the Bible. And I have a couple that I was studying with, and they were dogmatic about They were so angry because uh, their children, their in-laws lived in Texas, and they were going to visit their in-laws in Texas, but their in-laws wanted to sprinkle their baby, and they were so adamant about not letting them. We know if we, get, if we let them stay with her for an hour or two, they're going to they're gonna baptize, they're going to take her to the priest, and he's going to sprinkle them. And they were so angry, and I said, listen, you don't want to break your relationship with your parents. They know you don't condone sprinkling as baptism, but let them get the baby wet. It, it just gets the baby wet. You know, they know you don't agree with it, but you have to maintain your relationship with your family so that maybe someday you'll be able to reach them, you know. Oh, that's hard, isn't it, Danny, when you've got relatives like that are, that are uh, persecuting the family like that. Well, that's what I wanted to talk about tonight. As you examine this question, what wisdom does your, your, your life run by? I think we need to think about this upside-down kingdom in the face of all the wisdom of the world, Paul simply says, we preach Jesus crucified. And he wants us to know that we're going to be persecuted. What did he say in Mark? Remember, he was talking to his disciples and said, people are going to hate you because they hate me. It's just a fact. I mean, Jesus didn't beat around the bush. He said, they hate me, they're going to hate you. And so, don't be surprised if the world doesn't like you, if they don't bow down in front of you, because they don't agree with you. So expect persecution, just like the people in, uh, as Lyle was bringing up, the fact that there were prophets long ago that were persecuted. I mean, think about some of the prophets in the Bible who were persecuted for a moment. Can you think of any prophets? I'm thinking of the greatest prophet who ever lived. That's what the Bible says. Moses was the greatest prophet who ever lived. I never considered him a prophet, but that's what many of the scholars believe. How was Moses persecuted? Can you think of any ways he was persecuted? Anybody? 
Get that microphone. Barry's too, he doesn't talk loud enough. <laughs> Thank you. What did you say, Barry? He didn't get to go in the promised land. I mean, he didn't uh, get to go to the yeah, promised land. Yeah. That's a form of persecution. He, he had to suck it up, didn't he? His what else, what his, else happened to him? His persecution is he had to deal with the Israelites for 40 years. <sighs> oh, man. Lyle, could you have done that? The rod that parted the Red Sea in my hand would have probably parted Israelites too. <laughs> you didn't hear that, did you? <laughs> oh, he's a comedian too. Yeah, I agree. You know, I don't think I could have done it. I just look at the things that he put up with and wonder, wow, no wonder the Lord said that he was the most humble man in the world uh, taking that kind of persecution. Heidi? You just go forward. What's that? You just go forward. Go forward? Yeah. Yeah, that's good advice. Yeah, just keep going. That's what he did, didn't he? Yeah. I love to listen to the conversations between him and God. I don't know if it was Lyle or somebody brought it up in a class. <laughs> and anytime they had a conversation between Moses and God, what did he call them? Your people. <laughs> and God said, your people. Moses said, your people. It was like a tennis match there for a minute. Ping pong. Yeah. I think he was persecuted too because um, he led those people for so long and then he watched a lot of them die. Ooh. And... Uh, uh, you know, uh, killed. All, uh, there must have been a lot of his friends, yeah. a lot of those people that he knew that were actually, you know, God killed, and they wandered. That that whole generation wandered in the desert. Then he must have known those people. It must have been very sad for him to watch that that oh, entire wow. generation die. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that that kind of relationship is going to change things, isn't it? Having that kind of relationship for that long with these people. I still give him a lot of credit for dealing with what he dealt with. He dealt with. What, can you think of anybody else, any other prophets in the Bible that suffered? Can you think of anybody? Yeah. Uh, no, I was looking it up, studying it, but it said James was the first apostle to be martyred for his faith. He willingly dropped everything at the seashore to follow Jesus as his first apostle. James, that's a good one. Yeah, if you've ever studied any of the apostles, the horrible deaths they went through. James being the brother of Jesus, he suffered. Good point. Anybody else? Can you think of any? They called uh, Jeremiah the weeping prophet. The Bible says he laid on one side. He cried all the time. He was always crying over Israel. And they wouldn't listen to him. And he was just ignored and, uh, and made fun of. Uh, what a sad life he lived. Um, I just think of some of those prophets that people ignored them, wouldn't even listen to them, called them names, um, and, and made fun of them all the time. It, what a sad life. And, and Jesus is trying to get us to say, hey, look, if they had it that bad, your life is nothing compared to theirs. If we live com comparable, you'll see that. Somebody had their hand up over here. Zach? Zach? Um, uh, a couple months ago, I went over to West Broward Church of Christ and did a talk to the youth about suicidal thoughts and how to deal with them. And I brought up the prophet of Elijah, Ooh. where um, right after doing the, the, the God competition yeah. with the prophets of Baal, or Baal, um, Jezebel wanted his head, and he wandered away and went under a tree and wow. wanted God to kill him. And, and so that's, that was his persecution. You know, that was a big deal for him. And God still took care of him. Oh, man. Just read 1 Kings 18 and 19. It will thrill you to see the kinds of things that happened to him. Elijah. Wow. And, and that's why they, I've always thought that Elijah was the greatest prophet because on the Mount of Transfiguration, there was Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And the people looked at Elijah like the great, the great one, you know. Um, I'm thinking that's probably why he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, because everybody thought Elijah was it. He was, he was the, the greatest prophet. What do we got? Okay. 
I need to get into this quickly. Um, <laughs> I Russ, love the just, fact Russ, that... Just real quick, Russ. Yeah, we have go to ahead, be very Lyle. We have to be very careful, though, that we don't think uh, that just because uh, I have gout and I suffer with that pain that I'm being persecuted. There's oh. a difference between trials and, suffer and, the, and illness and experiencing death, etc. That's not persecution. That's just dealing with the fact that we live in a broken world. That's right. What Jesus here is talking about is when people suffer, they lie about you, they insult you, they harm you, uh, because you're standing up for your right relationship with me. Um, there is a difference, and so I think we need to be careful with that. Amen. Yeah, and that's why I think he, he really endears it to the fact that if we're persecuted for righteousness' sake, not these kind of things that Lyle's talking about, that we, we have to be careful about what we're looking at as persecution. I like what a, a this is what a, an author, Franklin, wrote. He said, uh, Sammy Dagar had been a maitre d' at the world-famous Phoenician, uh, that civil war in Lebanon, and just before war broke out, he left the hotel to plant a small church in one of the poorest areas of the city. When he approached the hotel manager to inform him that he was resigning, he had the following dialogue. God has called me to preach, Sammy told the manager. I'm leaving the hotel. Leaving? You're a fool. You're crazy. A man in your position making good money and you quit? Sammy said, I leave for something more important than money. I'm going to preach the name of Jesus Christ. You're going to give up this good position to preach for some God? You must be crazy. No. I'll tell you the right thing to do. You stay here and make money, Sammy. I need you. No. Sammy said, I can't stay any longer. I prayed, and this is what I must do. Then the hotel manager grew angry and shouted, I curse you one day, Sammy Dogger. You will come to the threshold of my door and you'll beg for a crust of bread and I won't give it to you. I'll tell you that I'll let you starve. Did you hear my words? Not one piece of crust. Quite some time later, during some of the heaviest fighting since World War II, Sammy heard a knock at his door. It was late at night, so Sammy told his wife and children to stay in bed. He answered the door himself. When he opened the door, the hotel manager stood before him. The man said, I couldn't sleep. I wanted to see how you're doing and talk to you. Sammy made coffee. They discussed the old days they enjoyed in the Phoenician Hotel in Lebanon, Beirut, Lebanon. Sammy sensed the man had come for another reason, but the man wouldn't say Finally, Sammy said, my friend, it's late. Why have you come to me? Oh, nothing, Sammy. I just wanted to talk about old times. The man walked to the door and opened it. As he stood in the doorway with his head hung low, he turned to Sammy and said, I have no food. I have not eaten for two days. Do you have anything you could spare? I think this preacher realized, he realized that when he talked to his manager that he was getting persecuted, but he knew what to do. He knew what he had to do. And eventually, people come around. Some of the hardest people will come around when they see how faithful you are. I've had people like that in my life, even the people that I golf in my two golf leagues during the week that kind of make fun of religion and me and, you know, what we believe in. But whenever there's somebody in the hospital in our league, we had 60, about 65, 75 people in our league, and they uh, gathered out on the lawn and gave me a microphone. They wanted me to pray for this man, Tom, who's going through some horrific cancer, and uh, all the men bowed their heads, and they wanted to pray for Tom, too. And when it comes down to it, a lot of people understand where the power is. 
they realize there's a higher power and we need him. I, I wanted to end with this. We got, what, eight, nine minutes here? Let, let me go through this. Um, I think that, that the thought here, uh, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. I want to end with this. By the way, if you think about it, pray for Tom. Um, his home is right on the 8th eighth, eighth, uh, fairway in the golf course there. and He's always out there at the pool, sitting next to the pool when we're, when we're driving by and playing golf, and, and he wants me to come over and talk to him um, because he's going through tests. He's had so many operations. Uh, the, bone, the cancer might be in his bones, so he's very concerned. So pray for Tom. I, I would appreciate that. Let's go to 1 Peter 2, and I, I wanted to end with this because I gave you a, a real small thumbnail sketch of what Peter was talking about here, and I think we overlook it sometimes because we think, oh, the Lord was on the cross. Well, yeah, he was on the cross, but there was a lot of things he was dealing with while he was on the cross that a lot of people don't consider. In 1 Peter chapter 2, I want us to look at, uh, let's begin reading in 1 Peter 2, uh, let's look at verse 23. I want to start in verse 23. Um, Zach, do you have that? Okay, would you read verse 23 for us, please? When he was insulted, he returned no insult. When he suffered, he did not threaten. I love that fact that Peter's talking. He's revisiting the, the cross. Now, remember, remember P Peter was, uh, he was a, this is special to him because he, he was on the outs with the Lord because of his denials. It's three times that he denied the Lord. And so here he is talking about the cross. He said, what, was the, what amazes you about that verse? Is there anything that stands out to you in that verse when you read it? I, I heard a, one or two words that really stood out to me. Anybody? Felix? You see a word in there that jumps out at you? There might be a verse there, a word there that, and I'll share the one that, that really stands out to me. Danny? Yeah. He did not commit. Read your version. Verse 23. Who, when he was revealed, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, mm. but committed himself to him who judges righteously. I love that fact, that he, he was having insults hurled at him. Have you ever had any insults hurled at you? I, anybody? Have you? Anybody want to share that before I share mine? <laughs> I was in, a, oh, you've heard this before probably. I was in a, I was in a Chili's restaurant in Rochester, uh, Michigan. I was about ready to teach a class at Rochester College, and I stopped there for lunch, and there was a man at the bar. I was in the next room, but he was screaming on a telephone. Now, this is a, one of the telephones from the restaurant with a cord on it. Remember those old things? This is about 20 years ago. And he was screaming at this lady who was his secretary. And I had never heard anything like that before in my life. He was screaming at her, hurling insults at her, cursing her, telling her to get it done. And he was using body, her body parts he was talking about. Screaming in a Chili's restaurant. And the waitresses were crying. And it was, a, I'm telling you, people were upset in that restaurant. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll tell you how I did it. I said, hey, because he was screaming, so I had to scream. I said, hey, calm down. There's a lot of people in here. The waitresses are crying, you know. And he said, who said that? And I said, I did, you know. And uh, so I, I didn't have a gun on me, but I sure wish I had at that time. <laughs> he turned around. He was angry. Um, but I sat there, and I kept, I was looking at, I was reading something, and I was eating my meal, and he got done eating, and he came over to me, 
before he left. And he said, I'll see you in hell. He screamed at me. I'm not, I didn't scream like he screamed. And I said, brother, you need Jesus in your life. And that made him ang more angry. But he left, and the manager, I was surprised the manager didn't do something. It was so loud. I never heard anybody say things like that. Um, but I'm telling you, it shook me up. I've never had anybody tell me that, scream that in my face. And he was about that far from my face when he screamed it. Um, but that's what Jesus was going through on the cross, people screaming at him, hurling insults. Um, anybody ever had that done to them? Anybody? I'll show you. Oh, have you, Brenda? Was it unsettling? A five-year-old. Whoa. That's unsettling. In Michigan. It wasn't here. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Okay. That's a, it can be unsettling, can it? I had something happen to me in a restaurant in, in uh, Canada. I was there with a, I won't tell you the story. It's too long. But it was a horrible situation, too, in a restaurant in Canada. Um, and there was a confrontation in the restaurant. But I'll, I'll tell you that maybe if we later on as an example. But we've got about four minutes left here. I want to end with this, and that is that you are going to be persecuted. It won't come in the, like Lyle said, it may not come in the, in the, in the form of, a, of somebody screaming at you or hurting you, or it may not come as, a, as an illness. It might be something else, and that's what we're talking to, tonight. Uh, I did want to tell you a little bit about this other verse that Danny read. Read that again, Danny. Oh, okay. Instead, he committed himself, verse 6. No, that's not verse 6. 23. Instead, he entrusted himself, he committed to himself to him who judges justly. That's the magic verse. If you've been persecuted, Jesus said, I'm going to let the Lord take care of it. That's the key. If you're ever persecuted, if you're ever tested or hurt, remember, the Lord will take care of it. That's where your faith comes in. That's what Jesus said. I'm going to hang on the cross. I'm going to take this, and then I'm going to, take, and I'm going to believe and have faith that the Lord's, my Father is going to take care of this. That's where we have to come down. We have to think about that and keep it in the back of our minds. Um, as I told you, I was lecturing in the chapel at Rochester College, and there were some problems between the fraternities. Is that the girls or is that sororities? Sororities. sororities. And they had problems between the sororities. And we were studying this in the chapel, and I just read that verse. And I said, the next time that you're carrying your book bag across campus, think about Jesus carrying the cross. Just think about that. If you think you have it bad, and there were some sororities that had problems, and we were talking about what to do, you know, when somebody persecutes you. And after the closing prayer, these sororities met up front in front of the stage, and they were crying and hugging each other. And I tell you, the word really gets to people's hearts. It really cuts people, and that's what happened. They were crying and asking for forgiveness, and. I'm telling you, that's, that's really where Jesus is on the cross. So let's have a prayer, and we'll close with that. Father, we thank you for this example of persecution. We thank you that Jesus was able to not only endure the insults that were thrown at him, but also it entrusted to you to take care of because we know, Father, that vengeance is not ours. You tell us that vengeance is yours. So we want to leave it up to you and just make it through, get through the persecutions that take care, uh, place here on earth. And uh, we ask you to bless us, bless those that study at home, and we ask you to bless those that we prayed for tonight. And we pray this in Jesus' name.